There were 1,597 different books banned in 2021 alone. It's the latest culture war sweeping schools and libraries across America. But what is this even about? I mean, how big of a deal could this possibly be? Today, we're gonna take a deep dive into book bans using a concept that I literally learned in a school textbook, the six W's. Yeah, that last one is an H, but that's a separate video. And we're gonna do this in a slightly different order. Let's get into it. You may have heard a couple different terms thrown around when it comes to discussing controversial books, such as challenged and banned. So we'll start with what's the difference between the two? A challenge is an attempt to remove a book based on objections by people or groups. And it's more than them just expressing a point of view or ranting on Twitter, but they have to take actionable steps to get it removed from libraries and curriculum. Most of the time they're unsuccessful, but a banning happens when they are successful. Okay, with those definitions out of the way, we'll hop into why and when, and we'll tackle those together because they're very closely related. Historically, banning books falls into three separate categories, religion, politics, and morality. In the 1560s, the Spanish bishop Diego de Landa burned nearly all of the Maya manuscripts in an effort to eradicate their religion. In 1852, the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was written by Harriet Beecher Snow, was one of the first books in America to actually be banned. People felt that it sparked debates about slavery. In recent years, the top two reasons for bans that we've seen come from an effort to protect children from inappropriate sexual content and offensive language. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan said it best with, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. Which is a great segue into our next question, which is, who are the people banning books? All different types of people from both major political parties have pushed for censorship in literature, but the group that pushes the most is parents. With that, it's important to note that while book banning and challenging is the highest it's been in decades, so is nationwide activism to fight against bans. There's a lot of parents who have banded together to fight for the protection of information and ideas in schools. Assisting in the fight against banning books is the ACLU, PEN America, and the NCAC. They've been working with activists and educators and families to help them draft letters and prepare for meetings and mobilize opposition. Marcus Dole, who is the CEO of Penguin Random House, has donated $500,000 to help fight against book bans. He also gets the award for being the first white man discussed on this channel. When it comes to how and what the process is, I'm obviously not gonna give you a playbook on banning and challenging, and if you're looking for one, this channel is definitely not for you. But essentially, the person filing the challenge must read the entire book and then document why, how, and where the offensive action takes place. If they've managed to follow all of these steps in the process, which most people don't, then there's a hearing to determine whether or not the book is pulled. And if so, then it's removed from that institution. And that leads us to where. This is where the issue gets really important. This isn't just a couple of instances of angry parents insisting that schools solve a problem that they created. This has implications at the local, state, and national level. At the local level, we see parents and activists show up to meetings for school boards with lists of books that they want removed from libraries and class curriculums. The books that are most frequently challenged relate to race, identity, and sex. And while the numbers are high, the ALA estimates that 82 to 97% of cases actually go unreported because teachers and librarians are afraid of the repercussions that might come as a result. Often, educators are faced with pressure from lawmakers who threaten to cut their funding if they don't pull books. Oftentimes, this includes classics. And that takes us to looking at book banning at the state level because book banning in school districts is not happening in a vacuum. We need to zoom out a little bit and look at the bigger picture of education politics in America. District level book challenges are flaring up on their own, that's true, but they're converging with a rise in conservative state leaders stoking a fire. A Texas lawmaker compiled and shared with school districts a list of 850 books that he felt, quote, might make students feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, and other forms of psychological distress. 
And a month later, the governor issued an order to develop statewide standards to prevent the presence of books that discuss sex or sexual identity. Texas isn't the only state to look at here. We've seen Republican politicians in Virginia, Florida, and Tennessee ride this wave in an effort to push their own agendas in schools. And to add to all of this, school districts in 26 states have either banned or open investigation into books. And I quickly want to talk about this at the national level because we have even seen a case reached the Supreme Court. In 1982, a list of books compiled by Parents of New York United were deemed anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, and just plain filthy. Ultimately, the court held that the First Amendment limits the power of people to remove books from schools and libraries. But here's the thing, the decision was pretty split. Five justices ruled that it was unconstitutional and the other four ruled the contrary. And yeah, I guess you could say that we dodged a bullet 40 years ago, but the Supreme Court has become even more conservative in recent years. Okay, so that's the background and I tried to present that in as factual and unbiased of a manner as I possibly could. Speaking of factual, you may have seen sources cited on screen. I'll be sure to leave a link down in the description for all of those in case you want to check them out. And that was a lot of research. So if you got any value from this so far, I'd appreciate a thumbs up on this video before we hop into my thoughts. And I have a lot of them, so buckle up. Obviously, as a person who makes videos on the internet about books and reading and literature, I find any ban to be an all-out attack on our democracy and dumb as hell. Do adults have any idea what types of things kids have on their phones these days? We live in a digital age and almost any piece of information that you want is at your fingertips literally. What would be beneficial is if adults help kids to navigate those things and to process them. Pulling titles off shelves makes it difficult, if not impossible, for them to have open dialogue with people around them or with each other about things like racism or sexual assault. And yeah, I get it. Learning about racism can be a little bit uncomfortable, but you know what's more uncomfortable? Experiencing racism. Books are an important tool to help kids and adults learn about people beyond themselves. But we also have to consider that when we ban books that speak openly about marginalized experiences, we're ignoring all of the people who live their actual lives in those realities. And as we saw from the Ted Cruz fiasco, banning books is the perfect way to make them popular. This country has tried to take away my reproductive rights as a woman, our ability to vote easily in any location, the teaching of critical race theory in schools, math, and now books. But guns? Don't worry, y'all get to keep guns. My ancestors were brought to this country in an effort to make white people more comfortable, and the suppression of literature is essentially a return to the history that we fought so hard to get out of. <laughs> <laughs> 